Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ruth Etzioni. I'm a professor at the Fred Hatch Cancer Research Center and a distinguished scientist at the Center for Early Detection Advanced Research at the Knight Cancer Institute. I've been working in early detection in cancer for almost 30 years, and I'm delighted to be back at the dialogue this year. We really are at an epic point in the history of cancer early detection with the emergence of new multi-cancer early detection tests. And so today, I'd like to look forward to this new future and at the same time, recognize that we've been here before and think about lessons that we might be able to take from the past, from our history of cancer screening. These are my disclosures. And I'm going to start us back at ovarian cancer, truly a poster child for early detection. And thanks to Dr. Skates, you all know that ovarian cancer has a far better survival, 10 year survival of almost 90% for early stage cases, poor survival for late stage cases of only 15%. And that's almost 30 years now, a biomarker for ovarian cancer was discovered, CA125. And thanks to work by Dr. Skates and his colleagues, we were able to not only use knowledge of how this biomarker um, was elevated in ovarian cancer cases, but how it actually changed over time to develop very specific tailored tests for ovarian cancer screening that were shown to perform better than standard screens that simply used the biomarker level to identify cancer cases. And these tests were then used in the ovarian cancer screening trial, the UKC talks in the UK. And early publication, the first publication from the trial um, was very promising uh, after some delay, really showing a di divergence in the mortality from ovarian cancer in screen versus control arms. But just in the last week, long-term follow-up from the trial was published, showing in fact that there was no significant difference between screen and control arms. And this is why I say I feel that we're really at um, an epic point in cancer early detection because we have now results from a large trial in a cancer that we expected based on biomarker performance to show great benefit from early detection. And so we are pausing and we're digesting these results and trying to understand why the results uh, were not significant. At the same time as we're pausing and we're contemplating the reasons for this finding, there's a pull to the excitement and exuberance of new biomarkers and new multi-cancer tests. So we really are at this point of looking forward but with a caution from the past. And this is what I'd like to explore in my presentation. And here are some of the uh, uh, companies and the products, the, the multi-cancer early detection products um, that you've heard about in previous uh, sessions of the dialogue. And these different tests are leveraging commonalities across cancer that are reflected in the fragments of DNA that can be identified in the circulation. And there are common hallmarks or characteristics of, of the DNA of different cancers, whether it's methylation patterns, whether it's mutation patterns, or even the sizes, the fragmentation patterns that enable these tests to find signals for multiple cancers. And here are three different tests and some of the tests not only provide a cancer signal, but also an indicator of the likely tissue of origin. So it's understandable that these tests are generating a great deal of excitement. But what do we know about these tests so far? Well, first of all, we know that they can find cancer when we know it is there. We know about their performance. 
the early studies of the tests have examined how well the tests can detect diagnosed cancers. Here's an early study from 2018 of the cancer seek test that shows um, the uh, sensitivity of the test um, in the middle here by cancer stage and across on the right here, the sensitivity to detect different cancer types, some of which have no screening tests in existence. And you can see that the sensitivity is certainly um, higher for later stage um, tumors than for earlier stage tumors. And this pattern is replicated for a different test. And here's a 2020 publication uh, which shows that in this test, again, sensitivity increased with stage. And this test also produced a tissue, an indicator of tissue of origin. So on the left here, we have sensitivity by stage in uh, two different sets of samples. Uh, very comparable, and on the right, we have the fraction correctly localized by stage. What else do we know about these tests? Well, we know that they're highly specific. So a highly specific test has a low false positive rate, and this has always been critically important in cancer screening because the majority of persons tested do not have cancer. So here's a, a little graphic just showing all the gray figures do not have cancer. And so when you're testing a population in which the vast majority actually do not have the cancer that you're seeking, then it's very possible, even if you have a specific tests, that the sheer number of false positives will outweigh the true positives. And we always want to make sure that we're controlling the fraction of false positives to true positives because that directly impacts the ratio of unnecessary biopsies to cancers detected. So we know about the performance of these tests, but we also know that policy screening decisions and whether a test ultimately does more good than harm in the population depends on, not only on performance, but on critical outcomes such as lives saved, uh, unnecessary biopsies and costs. And there's really a gap from performance to outcomes. Good performance does not automatically imply good outcomes. And there are three drivers of the connection between performance and outcomes that I want to spend a bit of time explaining. And they are the sensitivity to detect latent disease, the opportunity to detect early latent disease, and the curability of early disease. And I'll explain what this star means in just a moment. So sensitivity to detect latent disease. So here I'm just drawing a schematic, a timeline of a cancer from inception, detectable inception, uh, through early stage and advanced stage. And I'm showing here a time point of diagnosis. And the sensitivity estimates that have been published pertain to sensitivity at this point, at the time of diagnosis. But in early detection, the relevant sensitivity is, of course, the sensitivity, the ability to detect the tumor while it is latent before it is diagnosed. And that is not actually very hard to, it's very hard to estimate. Even for uh, some of the existing tests like mammograms, the, this relevant sensitivity is difficult to estimate and we have proxies for it. But this is what we really need to know. And the sensitivity to detect a cancer is not only about the sensitivity of the test, it's also about what we then do afterwards to readily and accurately confirm the presence of disease, whether it's imaging or whether it's biopsy. We tend to think of those confirmation tests as being perfectly able to identify a latent cancer, but in many cases, that's not the case. So it's the combined sensitivity that really matters. Now, opportunity is the second factor, the second driver of the translation of performance to outcomes. And what, I've, what I mean by opportunity is the time that the test has to detect 
early latent potentially curable disease. And if you notice from the previous slide, I'll just toggle back, I shortened in this slide the duration of early stage disease to make the point that even if we have a perfectly sensitive test, if that interval is short, we may not have the opportunity to detect it with standard screening uh, strategies that screen maybe every year or every two years. And published studies tell us very little about the duration of early stage disease, and it's very difficult to identify. Even when you have data from screen cohorts, you can really only learn about this duration when you have data on screen and interval detector cancers from screened cohorts. And many of the cancers that multi-cancer early detection tests are um, diagnosing, those cancers have never been screened for, and we have very little information about this duration of the curable interval or the treatable interval, um, and we have very little information about the opportunity. But if we don't have opportunity, then even a highly sensitive test may not induce a, uh, a benefit. And the last factor here is the curability of early disease. And with the star here, I mean the curability of those cancers that are shifted earlier by screening. Um, is their survival also going to be correspondingly shifted? We tend to assume that this will be the case. In fact, this is one of the, really the foundations of early detection research. But we have to recognize that the assumption that shifting a case earlier will provide a corresponding survival advantage, this assumption is making another assumption, which is that early stage cases are just earlier versions of late stage cases. And we know that that's not always the case. For example, in ovarian cancer, late stage cases tend to be type two cancers that are more aggressive, and early stage cases tend to are more likely to be type one cancers that are more slow growing. And so it's not clear that the early stage survival is really reflective of what we might expect for cases shifted to an early stage by screening. And this is why we need trials, because it's very hard to address each of these drivers and to learn about them individually. But when we have a trial, the trial tells us whether they're all coming together to, um, to, to, to translate performance to outcomes. And if there's one take home message from today, it's that multi-cancer early detection, while performance is promising, that there is still a high degree of uncertainty about whether this translation will happen. Because published studies give us information about sensitivity, but not to detect latent disease. They don't give us information about opportunity and we know that there's uncertainty in addition about curability because the key assumption that shift stage shifted cases will be as curable as current early stage cases is still an assumption. So talking about trials and what they might and how they might inform about the translation of performance to outcomes, what might we, if we look to the ovarian, to the UKC TRUX trial, you know, what might we learn about sensitivity, opportunity, and curability? So we, we know that there's a, a proxy for sensitivity, um, showed a very high sensitivity of 85% for the um, algorithm used to, um, that used CA125. But it relied on ultrasound imaging of the ovaries to move to biopsy. And we know that early type 2 aggressive tumors actually begin in the fallopian tubes. So the sensitivity of this mixed modality screening to detect latent disease, there may be, the data may be suggesting a question about that. How about the opportunity? In the screening arm, the incidence of stage 4 disease was reduced by almost 25%. But stages three and four, sorry, that should be three and four, were reduced by only 10%. So there may have been opportunity to detect disease before it reached stage four, but there may not have been opportunity to detect disease before it reached stage three. 
And as for the curability, well, there was a 10% reduction in stage three plus four incidents, but no difference in disease specific mortality. So in addition to other questions that are beginning, that people are thinking about regarding the trial related potentially to design uh, uh, questions and follow-up questions, the trial really suggests that maybe one or more of these drivers needs to be more closely looked at with respect to ovarian cancer screening. Well, trials are not the only way that we can learn about these drivers. Um, and I'll note that if, the, if we could do a trial, the, it would take many years. Trial, screening trials traditionally have taken at least 10 years or more to provide results. And unfortunately, there's, even though they're needed, they're rarely the final word. They're complex to interpret um, and, and, and always, always require further investigation and analysis. Prospective screening study, studies um, are another approach to try to give us a window into some of these drivers. And what in prospective screening studies, there is no control group, but a group of uh, patients, a group of volunteers are essentially screened using the technology and then followed over time. But since there's no control group, it's hard to make conclusions. And modeling analyses, uh, as I've noted, are, um, um, there's a lot that we don't know about the, uh, um, the, the, the duration of curability of many of these cancers. And so modeling studies are subject to information gaps and make many assumptions, but they can give some potentially some ballpark predictions uh, require tremendous transparency so people understand the, um, the caveats of their results. Here's a recent prospective study, a uh, follow-on to the cancer seat. Um, in which 10,000 women were given the test. Um, and after this test does not give a tumor of origin, a, tu a site of origin, a tissue of origin. And so um, the, the, um, after two positive tests, patients were given full body PET CT scans. And uh, 26 cancers were detected by the test. Um, and uh, you can see the other results of the study. Other cancers were detected, but not by the test. And these kinds of studies can give somewhat of a window into this question of latent sensitivity and opportunity for detectability. But what they don't tell us is where the cancers detected had their fate changed by being detected. And so they can only be suggestive and they cannot be conclusive. Here's a new modeling study uh, with an interface that um, we've uh, produced that is um, currently um, provisionally accepted. Um, and, and what you can do with this is, um, is, a, is a, an interface that um, can be used to actually configure a test here. We've configured a test for five different cancers. We provide the sensitivity, the localization accuracy, and the reduction in mortality that might be expected per cancer. And then we produce several useful outcomes, but they really are only ballpark predictions because that reduction in mortality is at this point uh, anyone's guess. We have some bounds from trials, but uh, this is just to give people a sense of the numbers um, uh, um, of some of these uh, uh, relevant outcomes that we might be trying to get our hands on, thinking about in the absence of further data. So uh, I have a couple more slides. I wanna just generally wrap up and then I want to make just a couple more points here. Um, clearly, this is a critically important technology advance, but the complexities of early detection are as present as ever. Because we have uh, more prevalence across multiple cancers, we expect relatively few exposed to an unnecessary biopsy per cancer detected, but a more complex confirmation process. And guidance is really still lacking about how this should be done and it probably be, will be highly variable as these tests roll out. The tests will likely detect some cancers that we do not currently screen for, as was found in the Detect A study, but it's unclear whether their fate will be altered. And we really, at this point, at this epic moment, need to heed the timing and message of the ovarian cancer screening story. But I just want to mention that we want to also learn from the prostate cancer story, and let me explain what I mean by that. This is a curve from the SEER program that shows mortality for prostate cancer um, before and after the introduction of PSA screening. Uh, PSA, I have this freight train here. 
Um, we have technology rushing at us like a freight train, and that's exactly what happened with PSA. It was approved by the FDA for monitoring, not for screening in 1986, rapidly disseminated into the population for screening, um, as well as for diagnostic and surveillance purposes. In 1993, um, the US trial started, also a European trial. And so we were left without trial results, but a population adopting a new technology and changes in outcomes and um, many questions about whether this was due to screening, treatment, or both was screening working or wasn't it. And we have not tracked the rollout of prostate cancer screening, and we had to retrospectively construct it to be able to learn from the population. Eventually, the trial results were published in 2009. They were not conclusive, and the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force disapproved, um, recommended against PSA screening in 2011, has since softened their recommendation, but the controversy still continues. And I believe that that really was a function of not tracking the rollout of PSA screening. When you have data from the population, you cannot help but try to make conclusions from it. But the population is the ultimate uncontrolled experiment. And so we are strongly urging the uh, initiation and development of a data resource to track the utilization and outcomes of these tests while we await further results regarding harm, benefit, and cost, which may be years down the road. We need to understand if these tests are affecting outcomes, if they're affecting health disparities, if they're benefiting patients, and we'll need to know that sooner rather than later. So with that, I'll end here. I'd like to thank my collaborators. I'd like to thank my support. Um, our calculator is up. Um, encourage um, any feedback uh, if, you, if you have a chance to take a look at it. And thank you to the Prevent Cancer Foundation for the opportunity to share this presentation with you.